educated uh, studied lo European law and political science from the Sorbonne and from Sciences Po uh, Paris, uh, l'Institut de Sciences Politiques, and Univ Edinburgh University. And she completed her PhD, which was uh, to do with the administrative reforms of Neil Kinnock in the UK. She completed that under an old friend of the Institute and an old friend of many of us here, Bridget Laffin. So uh, uh, she teaches comparative politics, uh, European policy making, and institutional politics as well as French politics. Uh, she's published recently an interesting looking book, and I must uh, uh, try and get it, uh, Reforming the European Commission, published in 2011. Um, she, she has also been involved in another interesting initiative, in uh, over a few years, she ran participative conferences aimed at raising awareness and debate among youth on European issues. And maybe we could be doing with more of that. So, without further ado, um, Emmanuel Schön Quinlan. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my first time here and I'm delighted. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the, um, the elections in France, but more uh, looking more uh, at uh, the impact um, it will have uh, in Europe and on Ireland. Now, um, unlike what Robert said, I am going to have a quick look at the results because some uh, elements are, uh, I think, quite striking. And then I'll move quickly on to uh, the, the issues of Europe and Ireland. Okay. Um, so you all know that um, the, the, those legislative elections in the second round saw the highest level of, absten of abstention under the Fifth Republic with 57.5%. It is higher than uh, European elections that are tra traditionally attracting very few voters to uh, the polling, polling station. And it explains as well the level, or it highlights the level of anger or just the crisis of representation and representative demo democracy uh, in France. And it's something that we should always keep in mind when looking at this the next five years. Uh, overall, obviously, La République En Marche got uh, uh, an overall majority, independently of their modem ally, which is very important in the face of the resignation uh, of this morning and yesterday evening. Uh, there was a question about the underperformance of La République En Marche, um, because uh, between the two rounds, uh, it was projected they would get 410 or 430 seats. Let's be honest, um, La République En Marche didn't exist 15 months ago, so it's a huge achievement. Um, and we cannot talk about uh, underperforming. Uh, the illegit illegitimacy of Macron, again, um, uh, seems to apply only to La République En Marche, not to La France Insoumise. If people uh, want to mobilize, they go out and vote. Uh, if not, obviously, there's always this idea that uh, the opposition will be in the streets and somewhere else than in the representation, the national representation. So we've seen the collapse of the traditional forces that uh, Robert explained uh, really well. We're now facing divisions among the Les Républicains uh, between the constructivist and the obstructionist, like the Laurent Vauquier and the, um, the, the kind of um, Thierry Solaire. Um, and we have a PS in disarray who probably in two years' time we won't be talking about the PS anymore. Um, the La France Insoumise uh, did perform uh, quite well and kind of consolidated their result from the um, presidential election. Le Front National, again, was projected to get between three and five seats, achieved eight plus one because there's La Ligue du Sud. I didn't even know Bompard was part of La Ligue du Sud, but uh, so you have about nine uh, extreme right-wing um, uh, MPs. Uh, Marie Le Pen, who mustn't be very good at maths, is thinking she's going to get a political grouping, but you need 15 members, so I don't know where she's getting the extra six. Um, but this is the, the kind of uh, general um, kind of uh, scene for uh, our National Assembly. And as you see, the level of participation there um, going down. Uh, in the last three presidential elections. Um, now, what does it mean? There has been some change between the first and the second round with some local anchoring uh, actually working to rever reverse the La République En Marche tsunami that was uh, anticipated. Uh, and that worked more directly for males from 
the Les Républicains. Uh, they tended to do uh, better. Uh, but overall, the message is uh, French people are giving a cautious chance to uh, Macron. Uh, it also, as um, Robert indicated, showed the resilience and the force of our institutional system. Like when you have a president that's elected <laughs> from a party, there will be a majority automatically uh, elected uh, from the same party when the elections are held so close uh, together. Um, I, I tried to translate, but since I must have a lot of francophones, I'll say it as well in French. Um, the, les Républicains campaigned on this idea first of cohabitation, and then when they realized this is not actually catching, they went on covoiturage. So it's my cohabitation and carpooling, but it doesn't rhyme in, in English, or it doesn't sound as good. Um, and, and the covoiturage might work for some. As I said, Thierry Soler now is after setting up his political grouping. Whether he might enter government is another question, but there will be a part of the Les Républicains supporting Macron uh, anyway, but it's a presidency under surveillance from the 57.5% of people who didn't go out to vote uh, and from uh, others uh, who voted against Macron. So what kind of a profile for the National Assembly? We have 75% of renewal of faces in the National Assembly. It's not only because of La République En Marche, you know that the dual mandate legislation also uh, pushed your standard mainstream parties to uh, present new candidates because a lot of the outgoing uh, MPs decided to retreat on their local mandate. Um, so we have 434 out of 577 new uh, MPs, which is quite striking. And even more striking, 38.6% of women, which is an utter record coming from 26.9% uh, before. La République En Marche presented 47% of female candidates, nearly parity. Um, and 223 women were elected across uh, uh, all uh, the range of political parties. Obviously, we have quotas, you know, from uh, the legislation of 2000. Um, and parties have to pay financial uh, penalties if they don't comply with the number of candidates they put out. And traditionally, Les Républicains are particularly bad at it. They've, they've improved a little bit. Um, but what was important is that there was no incumbents uh, from Les, La République En Marche. So you had less men as... Uh, Rainbow Murray said, hogging posts and kind of holding uh, onto posts for dear life. So it was easier to uh, have uh, more uh, women uh, put forward. Okay, um, I want to focus a little bit um, on populism because I didn't mention the Front National really. Um, <clears throat> and and this, I want to make a link with the 57.5% of people who didn't go out to vote. Uh, as well as La France Insoumise. Um, France is really fractured in two, and it was very visible uh, during the uh, presidential election when you looked at the map of who voted for who. Um, and it's fractured between the France of the periphery and the France of the metropolis. And it's Gulli, um, a French sociologist, that has theorized that. So basically, Macron has captured the, Fran the France of the metropolis. The France that is optimistic, doing well, seeing its future in Europe, in a globalized world, that thinks that our opportunities come from an open France. And then the France of the periphery are the ones that are left behind, the ones that have suffered from um, you know, deindustrialization, the ones that have seen their public services close down, the local hospital closing down, the police station, the post office, etc. And they don't see their future in a globalized world. They actually think that the European Union is a threat to uh, their future. So you can say a France of the pessimist versus a France of the optimist. I don't know, but there's definitely a divide, and this is the biggest challenge, challenge that Macron has got to face now, to try and reconcile those two uh, Frances that are very much at odds uh, with each other. Um, Mouda and Kat Vasser um, have got this um, saying that populism has become an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. 
on democratic liberalism for me rings back to, or brings us back to uh, people not feeling heard, feeling, okay, we're going with this neoliberal economy, etc., or economic policy, but it's not listening to our concerns. We are not moving along with, uh, with uh, we're not on the train um, to a better future. Um, and this is why I, I would say that there are three things which will see populism retreat in France. First, economic results. Uh, Macron has got to deliver, and there's, it's not a surprise that he focused on his labor law uh, through ordinance um, at the very start. He's got to uh, reduce um, the, the level of mass unemployment. As we were saying over lunch, there's, um, he's in a good trend. It's, he's at the start of a positive economic cycle, even though interest rates are going back up. So our debt will be more expensive to repay. But, uh, you know, unemployment is going in the right direction. Uh, economic growth was confirmed by Lindsay at 1.6 for this year, 1.6%. He's, he's got the, the tools um, or the right economic indicators for him. Uh, he has to reduce the number of uh, scandals involving the political elite. Uh, this is not a good start to his presidency. Um, but he's handling it relatively well. Obviously, it's not a good thing that the minister who uh, is in charge of passing the, moral, the legislation for moralization of public life had to resign. But, um, but still, like this is to reconnect and to have this feeling of trust in our political elite. We need to cut out um, the, the number of uh, scandals that are uh, emerging. And uh, finally, the f give the people the feeling that uh, they are heard. And this is what Macron, I think, if there's one word for me that symbolizes Macron, is pedagogy. Uh, when you, and and the, the, the crucial event, but not, it wasn't the only one, was what he did with the Whirlpool uh, company that was about to close. And uh, Marine Le Pen, he was meeting the trade unionists in the Chamber of Commerce. Marine Le Pen decided to gatecrash his gig and to go on the car park to take selfies with the workers you know, tweet, etc. use social media. What did he do? He left the Chamber of Commerce. He went there. He was booed. He took an hour and a half away from the journalists to speak face to face with those trade unions. And he left shaking hands. Being told we're not, we're not really fully convinced, but earning that respect. And this is what he did in the debate between the two rounds as well. He killed Marine Le Pen, not only because she was incompetent, but just because he explained, you know, you know point by point, never losing his composure, always being clear, explaining that SFR isn't Alstom, you know, and, and just um, uh, making, uh, you know, being always very uh, clear in his communication. Um, now, what does it mean for France and Europe? We're at the start of a period of significant uh, uncertainty. Robert has highlighted it when it comes to the party system. Um, Macron has all the levers to carry out the reforms he outlined uh, very clearly during his campaign. We're back to pedagogy. Macron, unlike, I think, all the former presidents that I can think of, has, an, has announced his reforms in advance of getting into position, even the difficult ones. So there's no surprise. Nobody can turn around and say, oh, you're going through ordinance. Oh, you're touching labor law. Oh, you're... No, no, all this was, was clearly announced. So... Um, this is uh, very important. Um, he is he is also announced very clearly that he's in favour of a relaunch of European integration through a, a, a rekindling of the Franco-German partnership, which has always been at the heart of European construction. But that is uh, uh, very uh, important and. We are in a climate of Germanophobia, be it Mélenchon or be it Le Pen. Has, they've both said, well, it's Merkel who's ruling France, really. Um, so, again, a very um, courageous move, but very clear from the start. And, um, and very importantly, um, because we're France, <laughs> our international status on uh, the international, you know, our status, sorry, on the international scene is very important. We've gone through years of French bashing, you know, being criticised in international magazines and newspapers, the New York uh, Times, etc. And uh, you saw that Macron, like, spent his first month putting us on the map in a very positive way, replying to Trump in English, nobody had ever done that, uh, using very cleverly his uh, make uh, America great again, you know, um, to make the planet great again, um, uh, but being very firm with Putin as well, you know, like in a press conference saying, these are not journalists, they were just used for propaganda. Um, so that 
made you know, uh, French people, I think, uh, very proud, and it is important uh, for French people as well. Uh, but he needs credibility, and he knows that as well. He's announced that in advance, and he did say that the only way he could get leeway in um, reforming Europe, and I'm going to come to that, is by carrying out structural reforms in France, by finally getting France not to breach the Stability and Growth Pact, which would be a first. Um, and, and he's put key, uh, key ministers in, in uh, the financial and the public expenditure posts uh, who are from Les Républicains um, and are consider considered very um, you know, highly uh, in Germany. Um, and in particular, Le Maire is a uh, Germanophone, which helps. Um, okay, so what's Macron's vision for Europe? There are three aspects. So first, a Franco-German um, engine of integration. Merkel, who earlier on, um, at the very start of the presidential campaign, was against any treaty change. She was against this idea of a budget for the Eurozone. Schäuble is on the same line. Um, has now come out saying, Minister for Finance of the Eurozone, Eurozone budget, economic governance, I can imagine it all. I can imagine it all if the conditions are right. Um, so that is giving a huge boost uh, to, to Macron as well. He wants a more social Europe. It, ha it will have an impact on Ireland. I'm going to discuss that at the, the very end. But he wants a more social Europe and he wants to move on uh, uh, European uh, defence with a European headquarters, uh, the creation of a European Security Council. Um, so he has very clear ideas when it comes to um, Europe. Um, Der Spiegel, um, about the, the week after he was elected, um, did their front cover uh, with a picture of him, and it was the title was A Very Expensive Friend. And inside, you had an interview um, with Schäuble, where Schäuble very clearly was like, we like all of his ideas, we're not going to spend a penny. So we're not going with his investment idea, and etc. But the structural reforms and complying with the SGP, yes. But, you know, the rest, uh, no. So uh, we were discussing whether Schäuble could be on his way out uh, if Merkel is re-elected. On the 24th of September, we have uh, German uh, parliamentary elections. Um, a few months ago, the SPD looked like they, they were in contention. Uh, today, much less. Uh, so uh, we'll see. But obviously, uh, Sigmar Gabriel would be a better um, kind of friend to Macron than Schäuble. Um, and Macron represents, I mean, we, we've all heard across Europe the sigh of relief when he was elected, but not only because he was elected against Le Pen. I think he is a response um, to, uh, by the center to populism and Euroscepticism. He is the only candidate and elected president that I can think of who did all of his rallies getting European flags waved together with French flags, and from the start pitched his campaign on a European platform. I have never seen that, and um, I did a conference recently, and I was asked, was it luck that he picked that topic? No, it wasn't luck. I mean, it was very, very courageous and very uncool to actually, um, if you look at the, the past presidential campaigns, there was no political gain in picking the Euro European integration as a topic to campaign, um, and everything was done as we call the you know, permissive consensus, like the, this kind of, let's all be in agreement, and not discuss it and brush it under the carpet and carry, it, you know, carry uh, on uh, as we've done so far. Uh, when you think of 2005, 55% of the French people rejected the European Constitutional Treaty. 2007, Sarkozy is elected, put together the Lisbon Treaty, which is a mini version of the European Constitutional Treaty. And that didn't play well with the French. Like, um, so uh, Macron uh, picked a topic that was difficult and stuck with it. Now, I'm just going to conclu conclude with that. What does it mean for Ireland? Now, Macron has met with Theresa May a few times already. Um, he's firm on Brexit. He's definitely on the German side. The EU27 are very united anyway, but he's clear that we're negotiated the, the divorce arrangements first, and then we'll discuss the trade agreements. Um, but we're not mixing the two. There's no wedge kind of driven in this uh, unity of the EU27. 
He's also doing it, I think he's doing it because he's convinced of it, but he's also doing it because he needs the Germans on his side to carry out all the reforms that um, I, I mentioned, and he wants um, the, the, this more social uh, Europe to take form. So talking about this more social Europe, he is well aware that Europe has been regarded as the problem rather than the solution. And he is also aware that even though he got an overwhelming majority, even though he got uh, elected comfortably, um, this is not the end of your scepticism in France. Um, so he wants to demonstrate that uh, Europe is there to improve the quality of life of citizens, uh, you know, and isn't there only for um, the benefit of multinationals. Therefore, in his program, uh, specific, uh, in his manifesto specifically, you have a line, um, a couple of lines about um, banning um, or, or fighting against uh, arrangements between states and multinationals. And there is a specific mention of the Apple ruling in Ireland. Um, so <clears throat> this is something that um, he's repeated a few times uh, and that he, he wants, like for Stagger, he really wants to uh, see that multinationals are there to contribute their share uh, and, uh, and for the benefit of investments for the European citizens. This, this idea of a more European, uh, uh, a more uh, social Europe. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to mention uh, Bridget's article um, a few weeks ago in the Irish Times, uh, which was called Ireland May Have to Sacrifice Sacred Cows to Survive Brexit. One of the sacred cows being uh, the uh, corporate tax, obviously not changing the 12.5%, but um, needing a, a tax code that doesn't undermine uh, other countries. Uh, the, she highlights how the outcome of the Apple uh, tax ruling or the Apple ruling um, is going to be uh, crucial and again making sure that those multinationals uh, pay the level of tax that they should pay. Obviously there's uh, the, everybody um, kind of watched the the Spanish company's um, case um, with Santander Bank, Santusa and Autogrill uh, that were in a similar kind of situation and the, 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 the ruling on the uh, selectivity criteria uh, was, uh, was very important. Uh, so it w we'll see um, how all this uh, plays out. But what um, uh, Macron wants is uh, a Eurozone budget and only countries that comply with um, the fiscal and social rules set for that Eurozone budget, i.e. harmonised um, harmonised, not homogeneous, but harmonised fiscal and social rules um, will have access to the Eurozone budget. And this is where I would be worried about Ireland, because obviously the harmonisation won't be at 12.5%. Um, it will probably be closer to 25%. Uh, between 20 and 25 percent, um, and and it made me think of uh, the Juncker uh, white paper on the future of Europe with his five scenarios, and Macron several times in his manifesto and in in a few of his spe speeches mentioned this idea of those who want to do more do more. Um, now there are two arguments here in a situation of Brexit. Everybody will be very careful about not breaking up Europe and not. Uh, having kind of a few countries moving further towards integration with this image of leaving others behind. Um, but they are uh, kind of um, um, seeds uh, for worry, I think, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal and uh, social harmonization that Macron would like to see. And as much as Germany wasn't in favor of it, now Germany knows that uh, with the with the level of Euroscepticism in Europe, the level of populism, um, it has to uh, make some effort and some gesture after a brutal economic crisis um, and, and show some kind of uh, goodwill.